Well, right, pretty good. Well, thank you for thank you for including me today. I appreciate this opportunity. The title I've been asked to address is nutrient management in cotton. Expanding that just a little bit, I would say we need to look at this nutrient management in respect to optimum soil fertility and maximizing our efficiencies in our cotton production systems. And I want to say too, first of all, I really appreciate being included here today. You know, I've much kind of returned to me to this kind of a program. And what I find is as young extension folks out here like Randy and Blaze, they're sharp, they're smart, they're suave, they're pretty debonair and it's nice to nice to be involved. And I appreciate the chance to do so. And I appreciate them bringing an old agronomist like me back on board to contribute a little bit here today. So see if I can offer some comments for their conversation worthwhile. Well, first of all, I think the this big story we all are dealing with, we recognize in desert agriculture, water is life. Water is central to everything that we do here. It's certainly our predecessors in the desert understood that dramatically so 800 years ago. And the folks that came out here about 100 years ago that began this culture of cotton production or irrigated agriculture, they knew it very well. They cultivated these lands to provide adequate water and that's what we're doing today. And we recognize too that this is the big game, the big story in town right now is our water shortages and the critical nature of the situation that's brought on the tier one reductions with the drought contingency plan, which is hitting central Arizona particularly hard. 65% of that water allocated out of the Colorado River through the CAP is being cut down this year. What we're trying to do too, looking ahead and that these tier reductions that are that are forecast ahead of us is try to slow down and retard the advance or the decline in the reservoir, particularly in Lake Mead, and try to keep us out of these tier levels of tier 2A, B, and 3, where they just get more, dr more dramatic, more drastic in terms of the reductions that we would experience on these on these allocations from the Colorado River. And there's several other irrigation districts and irrigation areas in the state that are experiencing reductions and shortages of water. So it's a common story, but it's central to our management of these irrigated crop production systems that we're dealing with and trying to maintain productivity and quality as we're, as we're discussing here today. In relation to that, I think it's important just to remind ourselves that all terrestrial agricultural, terrestrial ecosystems, including agricultural systems, crop production, our first limiting factor globally is sunlight. Well, that's not our limiting factor in the desert. We have an abundance of sunlight, but water is our first most limiting factor. So when we speak to, to nutrient management and soil fertility management, we have to recognize that's, that's incumbent upon us then to have adequate soil water conditions in the field, it means no water stress. Water, wa a water stress is imposed on the crop then that becomes the dominant factor. And we're not gonna make up for it with good fertility. And we're not gonna realize the benefits of a good soil fertility plant nutrition program unless we're maintaining water in adequate amounts. So it's critical for us on both factors, water and plant available nutrients at this time. When we speak to plant available nutrients, of course, we recognize there are 13 mineral nutrients recognized as essential to, to plants. And of course, then we have our three organic nutrients, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen that are brought into the plant through the miraculous process of photosynthesis. But all these mineral nutrients, however you add them up and count them up, they're all brought in through the, through the root system, through the soil plant root system and the interface in the soil is critical to us. And that's another reason why this water is important to us. But also too, when we recognize the nutrient requirements, it's important to recognize that not all of these nutrients have been recognized as required for all plants, but all have been found to be essential to some. That translates to us to understand the specifics of the crop in question. What are the crop in question, cotton in this case? What does it require? What are the, the nuances of the personality that this plant carries with regard to nutrient uptake and utilization? And we can do this with an objective of efficiency. And I would define efficiency really in three ways. We commonly say agronomic efficiency. That is, whatever we put into a crop, we should see a, a positive response agronomically. Economically, of course, we want a return on the investment. We want that to be positive. And then environmental efficiency, that can be considered both short and long term. But if we're leaking, well, these are leaky systems to begin with. But if we're losing nutrients in an, in an agronomic system, well, that's, that's damaging the system environmentally. And it's also hurting us agronomically and economically at the same time. So we can't address all three simultaneously, but that requires management on our part and an understanding of what ha is happening in this, in this system. 
Our potentials for losses and inefficient uptake primarily come from over-fertilization, leaching, denitrification, et cetera. We want to avoid nutrient imbalances. That's inefficient. But it's important to try to manage these nutrient inputs such that we tie them in with crop needs over time. So each crop has specific nutrient requirements. We recognize that, therefore, the, our understanding, the knowledge of a given crop, its unique uptake patterns, the distribution in the soil system, overall requirements are fundamental to understand then the next step of how much is already in the system, the soil plant system with regard to plant available nutrients. Total nutrients and total chemistry in the soil does not necessarily translate to what's plant available, but we can make an estimate of that with good soil tests. All of this kind of comes around, I'd say we can frame it up with what we commonly refer to as the 4R nutrient management, nutrient stewardship approach. 4R is meaning the right fertilizer source at the right time, thirdly, or the, at the right rate, and thirdly, at the right time, and then finally, in the right place. Source, rate, time, and place are all important considerations for us in a, in a management of a nutrient management system. So key concepts to consider. First of all, let's get a good soil sample and make an assessment of plant available forms of the nutrients that are present. Use soil tests with appropriate pro uh, procedures and appropriate indices. We have those. We use tissue tests with appropriate indices like nitrate, nitrogen, petiole, nitrate, nitrogen. We have that. Then make nutrient applications in line with crop uptake and utilization. That comes back to the four R's, timing methods, rates of application, et cetera. Sounds simple on the outline. And when we start out with these soil samples, well, the simple place to start is in the top surface of the soil. Usually I like a 10 to 12 inch soil sample. A lot of folks like a six inch sample, but you recognize that a rooting system for a crop like cotton goes down about four feet at least with an open profile. And those profiles change over, over distance vertically through the, through the soil from that top foot down to the bottom fourth. We don't sample them all for practical reasons, but we're trying to make an assessment, an estimate of what the plant available nutrients are simply from the surface soil, recognizing that that soil, that plant, that crop should explore that entire soil volume over the course of a season if it's an open profile. And it will be different by layers through the profile. We take that soil test, soil sample, we take it to the lab. We're running it with a, an indices, a, an analysis that we wanna be able to be able to gauge soil test values and see some relationship to crop yield. The soil test that we're working with today, we have those relationships. And what we're looking for basically in a particularly immobile nutrients is a point of kind of, kind of like a point of diminishing return. What's a critical test value where we have a 95% sufficiency? That means a very low probability for a yield response to increasing, increasing that, that soil test value or fertilizing, in other words, in relation to the crop yield. It's the area, it's the zone down below this critical value where we're making recommendations for fertilizer applications. So we're looking at this from a standpoint of application, agronomic, economic, and environmental efficiency. So we look at our soil test analyses that we commonly use for, for the desert soils that we're working with here in Arizona and the Southwest. And these are pretty well established. They're pretty well indexed for the crops we're working with. So if we take, for example, we look at a, at a, 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 a sodium bicarbonate extraction for an analysis for phosphorus. Our critical level says five part per million. You go down the line with, with potassium, we say with ammonium acetate extraction in a lab, 150 part per million as the cutoff, et cetera. These workforce, we've established them pretty well. My work with others in this group and elsewhere across the past 30 years, we've pretty well established these and we can pretty well tell you this work, workforce, if you're using the right analysis in the lab and they go back to these indices. So what can that say for us? For example, at critical level at five part per million P for a, for a high pH soil from a sodium bicarbonate extraction means we got to Less than five part per million means you've got low available P, probably need to fertilize with 70 to 100 pounds of, of P or P205 per acre. It needs to be band directed, can be incorporated, being probably best to be band directed into the soil. Five to 10 part per million, a moderate chance for a yield response. Well, probably less than 50% probability. Anything above 10 part per million for sure, we're sufficient in, in phosphorus. This is a time and place this year with high fertilizer prices, extremely high fertilizer prices, which is another story in itself. So we actually think about this carefully in terms of the probability of response with the rotations we have with wheat, alfalfa, et cetera. A lot of our soils have 
have sufficient phosphorus in the soils, sufficient potassium just based on base mineralogy unless you're dealing with a, with a very sandy soil. And most of the times our micronutrients are in pretty good shape, but these indices can, can, can guide us to where we, how we start, how we develop a plan. Cuts us down to nitrogen being probably the most critical nutrient for management. So when you take a soil sample, get analysis done, take a look at what you have. It's like Mick Jagger has told us, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, well, we just might find you get what you need. And we might have what you need in the soil already with some of these nutrients, particularly I would suggest phosphorus, potassium, and the micronutrients. Take a look at the soil sample and see, you might have a good start to begin with already. When we do apply, coming back to the, to the place of application, it's best to put that fertilizer into the soil, close to the seed row, close to the line of development with that developing root system. Broadcast applications can be used. They're not as efficient, uh, particularly with, with uh, some nutrients like phosphorus, where we get a lot of fixation, but it's commonly done. It's, I understand why. It's basically for ease of, ease of application. Then, of course, water run applications, primarily with nitrogenous fertilizers, they're not as efficient. We have, we're going to lose some volatilization in high pH water, high pH soil, high temperatures that we're dealing with. But we recognize the need, the, the, the practicality of applying, particularly after we lay by in the season, to get those, some of those later applications in. In principle, what we're trying to do with the nutrient like nitrogen, which is our most elusive and most challenging, we need it in largest amounts. And also, too, it's, it's a dynamic. It's changing all the time. What we're trying to do is take nitrogen fertilizer, optimize it in the plant available form, which is nitrate nitrogen. That is the principal plant available form of nitrogen the nitrogen in a soil plant system and get it into the plant. That's ideally our goal. What we're trying to prevent is losses from leaching, denitrification from anaerobic saturated soils, overly saturated soils, or ammonia volatilization, which is common in high pH, high temperature type conditions that we deal with. So there's really our, the leaky nature of the system in general, and what we're trying to do with our objectives and nutrient management, particularly with nitrogen. We can start with the realistic yield goal when we get this nitrogen plant established, and that establishes as a maximum amount of nitrogen demand that crop will require. Secondly, we can then measure or estimate the residual soil nitrogen, make an estimate or a guess on soil, soil mineralization capacity, but we can start with that estimate on residual soil nitrogen. We can make an estimate then of how much nitrogen is coming into this system through the irrigation water. In a lot of cases in central Arizona and really all over this state, we have well water, particularly that contributes in some cases significant amounts of nitrate nitrogen. So it's important to watch that quality of that irrigation water we're working with. That sets, helps us set a maximum then on what we might need in that field for, mat, for nitrogen fertilizer needs. And then we can split these applications and monitor crop condition within the season. Those are basically the five fundamental points that we would start with to manage in a, a, a nutrient management system for a cotton crop, starting with nitrogen. So look at this this way. It, we know this, it takes about 70 pounds of nitrogen per bale of cotton for, to produce that. And we've known that, that's been known for over hundred years, pretty well established. So for 180, 480 pound bale of cotton, that's about 70 pounds of nitrogen is gonna be required to produce it from all sources. That sets us a fertilizer nitrogen max with a yield goal. To say our yield goal is three bales as an example. Three times 70 is 210 pounds of total nitrogen will be required in that system to produce that crop. How do we get it there? That's the question. Well, let's say as an example, we find there's 10 part per million nitrate nitrogen residual in the soil, 12 inch sample. That's 40 pounds of residual nitrogen right there at the beginning of the season. Now I get that because there's 2 million pounds per acre for a slice times two times 10 is 20. There's two six inch increments. I just double that up. And that's where I get the 40 pounds of residual nitrate nitrogen from this example. Then let's say in this example, or we get three part per million nitrate nitrogen in the irrigation water. Or well, Andy can show you how he can derive a 2.71 conversion factor, which is solid. Take that times part per million of any constituent in your water, and that's how many pounds of that constituent is in an acre or acre foot of water. In this case, nitrate nitrogen. So three part per million translates, translates to eight pounds of nitrate nitrogen per acre foot. That's probably about every two irrigations, we're getting eight pounds of nitrogen. Five acre feet in the season, we're gonna estimate perhaps, they might go onto a field what's been used in the past, perhaps as an example, that gives us 40 pounds of N in this example. Add that all up, residual plus irrigation, 
water and nitrogen. That's 80 pounds that are coming into that system already to help us reach that 210 pounds. That leaves the difference then 130 pounds that we'd actually have to apply if we're efficient. We're very efficient with our fertilizer. So let's say 130, 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre will be my goal on this example field for this year. Then I would suggest we split those applications, 50 to 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre per application, monitor the crop and adjust what we do as the season goes through. Coordinate applications with crop demand is important using split applications, but when and how much? Well, we know this, with cotton, we verified this pretty clearly over the past several decades that it has two flux points that are critical. One is about pinhead square, first squares. The second is at peak bloom. That gives us the basis for what we've defined as our nit nitrogen application window. Prime applications for nitrogen can take place between pinhead square, early squaring, and peak bloom and accomplish what we're really setting out to do, provide the nitrogen for the plant at a time where it's ready to take it up and utilize it, incorporate it into the plant, and that'll carry that nitrogen capacity, fertility, on out through the latter half of the fruiting cycle without additional fertilizations if we take care of things up to peak bloom. Now that'll take us through the first, first fruiting cycle all the way through cutouts successfully, and we can monitor the crop as we come towards peak bloom for those last, for those last applications. But then we would say coordinate the splits of applications in relation to that peak flux time between pinhead square and peak bloom, split them at about 50 to 70 pounds of nitrogen per acre per application and evaluate the crop as we move along. So that gives us kind of an estimate then a plan from which to begin. Taking our soil samples, estimating our total fertility needs then projecting how we might split those for most practical efficiency and applications in the field, recognizing that the way the nutrients are taken up by the plant, just the way these plants have all evolved is through the root system. All water, nutrition, mineral nutrition, and physical support is provided by that root system. It's not, the plant's not designed for foliar application. So whatever we do, we're aiming our, our direction of, of application towards this root system and trying to maintain an, a healthy, vigorous plant root system for water and nutrient uptake. We recognize too, when we're leaching trying to avoid leaching with nitrate nitrogen, we are accomplishing a positive thing with that leaching, and that is through salt removal and maintaining a good salt balance in the profile. So it's a catch-22. We also know too, when we irrigate a soil, bring it to saturation, it drains away, that's when leaching occurs. So some leaching is going to take place. What we're trying to do on nitrate is just minimize it, and we do that by minimizing availability at critical times. I can't, as always, overemphasize the importance of getting into the field with regular field checks. Putting our shadow on the crop is probably the most important thing we put into that field. And watching it from all stages of growth for all these factors we're discussing here today, including the nutritional levels of the crop, and then looking at it in terms of whenever we walk into a field, you know there's three things I think we always look for. One is what's the stage of growth of this crop today that we're walking into? Secondly, what's the vigor? Third, What's the yield potential? And then that all contributes to our, say, synthesis and our decisions about what do we do next? What's in line? And looking at vigor fruit retention, we have fruit retention guidelines for cotton, height to node ratios for vigor. They work, and they work as a function of heat units after planting. We have that information available, but it requires us to go into the field and track. We also have indices for tissue testing with nitrate, nitrogen, with petiole sampling. All of it can be used to give us an assessment of where we are today, where we've been, and then we have to make decisions about where we go from here at any point in the season and maintaining a healthy crop with healthy yield and productive quality potentials for the end of, this, end of the year. And again, I think we can do this with high efficiency agronomically, economically, and environmentally. We can do that simultaneously, but the onus is upon us in terms of management. So let's just say you take like now, look back from what you did last year. Got two yeah. minutes, Jeff. Very good. Thank you, Randy. Yep. yep. You can look back and say, well, how do we do? You can say, well, if you had a really good case, you might say, I put in 50 pounds of nitrogen on a crop last year. And based on the yields, I picked that up based on what I had with, with residual and irrigation water contributions. That's pretty good. Probably unre unrealistic, but that's how we would maybe go back and make that review. Another example might be last year we put on 200 pounds of nitrogen in a crop and we recognized based on residual and everything else, we had 100 pounds recovered. That's about 50% efficiency. That's not uncommon at about that level. So it's good to kind of review what's done before, what works, 
And how would you look at the fields that you're based on the experiences you've had in the past? And how can we tighten that up a little bit and make it better for this year? High fertilizer costs will be a, a prime incentive and recognizing too, if we're gonna use that viable water, what water we have, having a crop fertility base that's ready to go is critical. So we can't really afford to lose on either one. And the, and the, the stakes are higher now than probably any time I've seen in my 35 years here in Arizona. So I really thank you for the time today. And I always, I don't like all of you, I, I take comfort knowing that Randy and Blaze are keeping an eye out for us and watching the landscape in Arizona and letting us know what's going on and bringing us together for good meetings like this so we can all be healthy and productive in the seasons ahead. Thank you for the time and your attention. If there's time today, anytime now or later, I'll be happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Great.